What would you then take him, Satan, and his, and his offspring for friends rather than me? And they are your enemies. Evil is the exchange for the unjust. Just a quick show of hands. Who was here for the last time, last week's? Uh, Saturday. Last Saturday? Most of us, I think. Okay, sure, inshallah. So tonight's lecture then, uh, I'm, tonight's lecture then we'll get, is going to be about this verse. And I'm going to recite it again. It's in chapter, surah, chapter 18, verse 50. What would you then take him, him is Satan, and his offspring for friends rather than me? Me is Allah. And they are your enemies. Evil is this exchange for the unjust. It's a very personal verse. It's a very, very personal verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to the Mu'mineen, it's amazing how we're almost given a position as if we're betraying Allah. Like who are we? To betray him. And in this verse, he speaks very, it's almost as if he's hurt with this betrayal. Imagine this powerful entity, the creator of the heavens and the earth, is almost saying as if we, me and you and us, but as if we hurt Allah. That's how personal this relationship is between Allah and us. We don't have a distant God. We have a very intimate person. We don't have a God who created the heavens and the earth and then let us be. No, He says to us, I'm nearer to you than your jugular vein. Yes, and this verse illustrates this personal relationship. And how ugly of a quality is treachery on any level. If you betray your government, you're considered treasonous. And the capital punishment is generally... The, is generally the punishment that's, you know, enforced upon the person who committed treason. Amongst friends, if you betray them. Imagine you betray your father or your mother for some worldly pleasure, $1,000, $50,000, you steal their company, for example. A brother, friends, even, for example, uh, people who've committed crimes have a certain code amongst them. Even they who are merely to break other moral codes, when it comes to treason, they call you a rat. Because it's so ugly. So it's almost in any echelon of society, from state to family to friends, a person that commits this act is always regarded of a very low standing and a very low quality. That's how ugly treason is. And the closer this relationship you have with this person, the more painful and the deeper it is. The more painful and deeper this level of treachery is. So, I just recited the verse. And Allah is closer to us than our jugular veins. So how deep is this betrayal? Not only of Allah, of ourselves. We betray ourselves, you think? Oh, you be person is bad who betrays his family and his friends and his nation and his community. If a person betrays his football team, he's considered a monster. Imagine now we betray even our own nafs and in turn betray Allah. How serious of a crime is that? How serious of a crime is that? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. We turn to Satan instead of Allah. Imagine how. So look at who we're exchanging friendship for. We're exchanging the friendship of Allah the creator of the heavens and the earth, the sublime, the eternal, for Satan, the creator, the evil, the wicked. How evil of an exchange is it for the unjust? Weigh the seriousness of that. And how we are treacherous towards Allah and towards ourselves when we commit acts of disobedience towards Him. And that's how we need to view these acts. 
Maybe a lot of us in our lives, I'll share, pers I'll, I'll share something personal. If I ever commit something I'm not proud of, or I'm not ashamed of, and I got this advice actually, subhanAllah, sometimes you hear something over and over again, and then for whatever reasons, it enters from one person. I was at the park, and uh, a Christian preacher, you know, he was going around and talking to people on the street, protester, preacher, I'm not sure what you call him. He came to speak to me. And I had no interest in preaching to him about Islam because he really interested me in what he had to say. And he said one thing that entered my heart and I took it. He said, whatever you do that you hate, understand it's your enemy. Hate it. Hate it, hate it. That's what he said to me. And subhanAllah, it really entered my heart. He's like, hate that sin. Hate that act. Don't look at it with any sensitivity or any softness, but absolute hatred from the depths of your soul. Look at sin like this. And honestly, whenever I find myself in any situation, I just, out of all things, I remember this guy sometimes. Hate that act. Because in that moment, I feel so treacherous. I have to hate it, and that's what I try to do, and that's something I try to remember. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. You know, and, and I'll share a story. Epictetus, you guys all know how much I enjoy Greek philosophy. He was a Greek Roman philosopher. He was a slave, and he worked for one of the courtiers of Nero, the, the ruler at that time. And he, say, and he shares a a beautiful piece of advice. There's a lot of hikmah. There's a reason these guys' words exist 2,500 years later. 500 years before Nabi Isa. 1,000 years before Rasulullah. And he comes and he says, Imagine you are posted by a general in the army. You would obey his command. And you would be willing to die a thousand times before committing treason to your state. But when Allah has assigned you to a post, but when, Allah, when God, he says, when the, God has assigned you to a post, and he has given you a set of duties, why is it that you not, why is it that you abandon them? You're willing, you're not willing to abandon the post that the general gives you. Yet why is it that you're willing to abandon the post that Allah has given you? He continues to say somebody finds greatness in himself if he's the son of whoever Caesar or ruler or Nero. He says, do you not understand? You are the creation and the son of God. What higher position of power do you want? And this is betrayed. And there's a story that I was told maybe close to 15 years ago. And still today, you know, I, I still go back to this story. And... Uh, so you'll ask us to bear with me. It's maybe a few minutes long, five minutes long. So there was this uh, young man, and he was charged with a crime. So he was taken to the court. And the judge told him, I'll believe your testimony, and I'll believe the character that you say you hold if you bring me a witness to vouch for you. He says, okay, no problem. I have a witness. And now I want you to put yourself in place of this person that's being charged with this crime. First thing that comes to mind is I have a witness, my best friend. The person I always go to, the person I trust, the person I hang out with, we have fun, we chill, we do this, we do that, we go here, we're always with each other, everybody knows it's always me and him, etc., etc. He's like your best friend. Now imagine all of us, we all have a best friend, someone probably popped into your mind, and imagine now that person. So he goes towards him, and he tells him this story, and I need you to vouch for me. He looks at me and he says, I would love to. Honestly, I would. But if my parents find out and I get involved in this situation, they're going to be upset at me. It doesn't look good on me. I mean, God forbid if you get, for, you know, you get convicted, I'll be there all the time. I won't forget you. I'll tell you what's going on with everyone. I'll come see you as much as I can, etc. Cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He was disheartened. He was, a, he was a bit heartbroken that his friend wouldn't stand up with him at that moment. And he says, well, okay, but I have a second friend. Now, the second friend is a person we all trust. The responsible person. He's decent. He always does what's right. He's never too flashy. 
He's not always too excited. He's just a responsible, decent, good guy. When you call him, you know he'll answer his phone. You know that guy? Now we all have a friend who's like that. So imagine him. He calls this friend. And upon calling, he answers like he always does. And then he says the exact same as the first. I'm sorry, you know what? I can't do this. But I'll be there for you. If you need bed sheets, you need money, you need a, you know anything you need to help you get through it, your affairs outside, while you're in prison, I'll take care of it. He couldn't believe it. His two friends turned him down. He goes to his third friend. And his third friend is that person you've always ignored. Now we all have that friend. You've known him for a long time. You've probably known him since you were a kid. He's probably maybe back home who knows where. He calls you, you don't answer. You always make an excuse that you're doing something busy. Oh, I have to finish this. Oh, I'm just at work. Oh, I'm going to the gym. Whatever excuse you tell yourself not to answer his call, not to reply to his message. We all have that friend. Great guy, solid guy, but for whatever reason, you don't even know why, you just always pull away from him. But you're desperate, you have no choice. You have to go to somebody, who are you gonna go to? You go to him. Without hesitation, being who he is, he's like, no problem, I'll be there for you. I'll go to court and I'll vouch for you. I know you're a great person. Now imagine the exact same scenario on the greatest court, on Yom al And when we go into that Qabr, that first friend is money. He'll get you the best lawyer, get you the best kafan, get you the best everything, but it will not enter that grave with you. It will not. The second friend is your family. It will write dua, it will read Quran for you, it will read ziyara for you, it will pay your debts, but it won't enter that grave. That third friend that we've all been neglecting, who will enter that grave with us, is who? Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That neglected friend. That one we've known since we were a kid. The one who we are treacherous towards, and he is never once treacherous towards us. In this world, you're good with people, and they in turn, and many times, they're not appreciative of it. And they complain, much less when you're bad. Because when you're bad, they don't forgive. Because if the doors of heaven was held by men, no one would be going into heaven. No one would be entering Jannah. Even when you're good, people find faults. Even if we all get married and we have children, even our brothers and sisters, to some extent, everyone will accept you to some extent, though. If not, betray you. But here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never upsets, never betrays. He's always there. And yet, we are always the one who turns away from Him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. What a deep betrayal. And for who? For Satan. For who? For some worldly pleasure. We all sit here, and we all just came out of the Ashr, and we heard the story of Umar ibn Sa'ad, and we heard the story of Umar ibn Sa'ad, and how he once read. He's not the only one, Harun Rashid, with Imam Musa Qadr. These people, they recognize the position of the imams, of the imams. Yet, the love of this world blinded them. But yet, we do la'na. We do la'na Umar ibn Sa'ad, right? But with all due respect, which one of us here has been offered right? Which one of us here has offered kingship and power and wealth? Who, you know, I've seen it firsthand, one time, not so long, not so, pretty recently. When you have wealth and power, the general laws of society change for you. I witnessed that. I was, I'm never usually sitting in circles of great wealth and power. Not so long ago, I was in a company of a person who had a lot of money. The way rules changed for him. The way people approached him and looked at him and wanted his friend, and, and no matter what he'd do, the things he would say, nobody else can get away with, but because he's rich, he can. So which one of us has been offered that kind of wealth to know that we wouldn't do the exact... For a thousand dollars or a hundred dollars, we commit sin. We betray Allah, much less the Imam. So it's easy to, to lana on Umar ibn Sa'ad, sure. But how treacherous are we? And we're not even offered right, or province, or a kingship, or power, or money, or wealth. We're offered paltry, small, tiny amounts. Such insignificant figures. 
The Muawiyah even makes fun of some of the judges when they sell their faith. He says, you sold your faith for such a small amount. Even when he gets them to his side, he even throws a little jab at the end. This is, you, 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 you viewed your religion very cheap. Muawiyah makes fun of the people that he bribed. And then, we go on to the second stage. Now we have to even be... This stage is even worse than the first stage. How bad is treachery? Now look at this stage. I want to go to Allah. But now, I think people need to look at me as if I am Allah. Why? Because I've been praying. Because I read Quran. Because I went to Ziyarah. Because I went to Hajj. Because I pray Salat al-Fajr. Now I'm religious. Now people need to look at me with some reverence. Now people need to look at me with some respect and honor. And they should come towards me and come say hi, and etc, etc, etc. Worse than that is not only with people we do with Allah. From the people, it's simple. You expect people, you, you know, it's amazing. The first, no one's worshipped Allah as much, I've made this point before, no one's worshipped Allah as much as Iblis. So if anyone has a greater right to show kibr, it's Iblis over any human that's walked on this earth almost. And yet the first sin we commit when we become religious is what do we do? We become like a bliss. We show pride and arrogance. He showed pride and arrogance against Adam. I become religious, I want to show pride against arrogance against people of community, against my family. I become all holier than thou, I'm better than everybody. Which is the exact opposite of the Mahsumin taught us. The Mahsumin said when you look at someone, always view him as better than you. Because you know of your sin, yet you do not know of his sin. This is the Mahsumin speaking. When I look at anybody, I know the filth that I've swam in. And yet I look at others and I'm going to think I'm better than them because I'm playing whatever and I'm doing whatever. That's one level. The other one is worse. The Quran says, chapter 49, what does Allah come and say? They think that they lay you, O Muhammad, O you is Muhammad, the Prophet. They think that they lay you under an obligation, a favor by becoming Muslims. We're telling us, Rasul, you owe me a favor, I've become Muslim. It's not only amongst us now. Say, count not your Islam as a favor upon me. No, Allah has conferred a favor upon you that He has granted you to the faith, that He has guided you to the faith if you are truthful. So not only do you want to show kibar, first, maybe even within myself, I think I'm of this level. Within myself, I'm like, man, I must deserve a lot. I woke up, I did this. I must, first of the kabras, then it could be exercised on others. I think I'm better than others. It gets to a position now, even with Rasulullah, you owe me. I've become Muslim. Allah, you owe me. I've become Muslim. I, you owe me a favor. And it's beautifully illustrated by the story by who? By Nabi Musa. Nabi Musa was walking in these foothills. And upon his little track, he noticed a monk praying inside of the cave. Praying. So he went towards him. They introduced themselves. The monk told him who he was. Nabi Musa introduced himself. He said, oh, you're Nabi Musa? The Prophet of Allah? He's like, yes. He's like, okay. Well, I have a favor of you. I have a question I would like you to ask Allah. He's like, no problem. What's your question? I'll ask. He says, this is the question he wants to ask Nabi Musa. Since the last 100 years I've been sitting and praying to Allah, I do not do anything other than pray to Allah. Ask Allah what He will give me for my efforts. I've been praying for 100 years in this cave. I want to ask you to ask Allah what reward, what he will He give me for my worship of 100 years in this cave. Allah reveals to Nabi Musa. He says He will have His answer tomorrow. So the Nabi Musa goes back to them and he tells them, tomorrow I'll give you back your answer. The man says, no problem, I have some errands due tomorrow. After a certain period of time, we'll reconvene, you'll share the story. You'll share the answer of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next day comes, the man goes to do his regular errands. Upon his travels, he gets lost in the heat and in the sun and in that mountain. He gets very, very thirsty. And upon his travel, he's looking for some water. Eventually, from a distance, he sees a man with a tumbler, with like a bottle of water, we'll say. He approaches him. He says, oh man, I'm thirsty, I'm this, I'm excited. He says, please, can I have some of your water? 
The man replies to him, okay, what do you have to give me? It's a world of, when you're dealing with Allah, there's no this. But when you're dealing with man, what do you have to give me? So, he says, I don't have anything to offer you. I've been only worshipping Allah for 100 years. The man, okay, he's actually interested by that. He's like, you give me the rewards, you give me the worship of you've offered Allah for a hundred years, and in turn I'll give you this water. Transfer. It's an interesting proposition. The man thinks to himself, I have no choice, I'm going to die of thirst. Maybe I'll live for another X amount of years. I'll continue to worship Allah, then I'll receive my reward for that. He accepts the deal. He ends up drinking the water. He gains back his mind. He finds his way back home. He goes back to his cave. Nabi Musa goes towards him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to Nabi Musa that this man has exchanged his 100 years for one bottle of water. I want you to ask him a question now. He says, okay. He tells him the question. So he goes to the man. The man says, he interrupts Nabi Musa. He says, no, no, it's okay. I already, this happened. Nabi Musa cuts him off. He's like, I know what happened to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told me. You traded your 100 years of worship for that one bottle of water. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now has a question he would like to ask you. The man was surprised. He's like, okay, what's the question? He comes and he says, But Allah has said that when the value of 100 years of prayer is one bottle of water, then he must settle the value of the water that he's been drinking for the last 100 years. You see the answer? He's like, you sold all your worship for one bottle of water. That I've been giving you water for a hundred years. What are you going to give me? Settle it. Settle it. At this moment, he starts to cry and he starts to feel bad. And he starts to add Tawbah and he asks Nabi Musa to intercede and etc. etc. At this moment, when he's upset and he's saddened and he's in a position of forgiveness and Tawbah and etc., Nabi Musa then gets another, another revelation from Allah. Allah tells him, he says, tell that pious person, your penitence of this moment pleased us more than your prayers of a hundred years. And for that, you are given the rewards of a thousand years of prayer. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Subhanallah. This is Allah. This is the generous hand of Allah. And this is who you betray. I, when I say you, astaghfirullah, I talk it to myself first. And then let's go to another man now. Who is also thirsty. Who is also thirsty. SubhanAllah. But with his thirst, shukr on his tongue. Shukr, praising Allah. Thanking Allah. It did not leave his tongue. He continued, like I mentioned that last week. For the brothers that were here last week, just bear with me. He comes and he says to he comes and he says to Rasulullah, O grandfather, when on the sands of Karbala and the weapon of the assassin will be at my throat, there shall be the words of shukr for Allah on my tongue, that you yourself will hear about it and witness the forbearance of Hussein. So one man is thirsty, one man wants something for his prayer. Here Imam Hussain, he is thirsty and he's continually doing shukr. This man was unthankful for 100 years of water. Unthankful for 100. The Imam is thankful for his thirst. And shukr is on his tongue. And he tells Rasulullah, you yourself will bear witness to the patience of Hussain. Look at that. You know, patience, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, I, I'm going to share this quickly just because it's in my mind, because I mentioned him earlier, Epictetus, and this just came to mind. I want to share it. He says, how sad is it when you are unable to employ a quality that you have? So imagine you're a great orator, like Muhammad Ali, and then he took Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, took away his speech. Imagine you're a great soccer player like Ronaldo or like Messi and you're unable to play soccer or football. Imagine you're a great artist, a great math, any quality you have of such a heart and you are unable, even within ourselves, whatever quality we are, 
but not something we can all share. He comes and he says what? He says, how unfortunate is a man that's given eyesight, closes his eye the second a beautiful painting comes by. Allah has given you the capacity to appreciate this art form with this sight. Taste with this mouth. And he lists off all the other, if you start listing, listing, listing. So we have a certain capacity that we can employ to enjoy something. How unfortunate is the man who robs himself of a beautiful painting when he closes his eyesight from it. But then he says, how much of a greater misfortune is when God has given that man high virtues, yet he closes them when misfortune befalls them. Look what he says. God has given you the virtue of patience. Why do we not turn to patience when misfortune befalls us? What a sad state, he says. Look at that. It's powerful. He's given you the ability to be patient. And when you need to employ this patience, you turn away and you complain. You complain about the things that are not in your control, and that's what you fixate it on. Like, for example, I was born, let's say my parents. I was born in this country. These are not within your control. And yet we complain about those. The things that we are in our control, our capacities, our virtues, that we're able to employ, we disregard those when we can exercise them. Yet to exercise them to such a high level, the these virtues that they hold. Back to Karbala. And going back to that man, he was unthankful for water. And the imam was thankful for his thirst. Now point two. The man wants to know what Allah will give him for a thousand years of worship. Look what Hussein says now. Look what Hussein says now. He gives Akbar. Let's not go through the rest. He gives Akbar. That alone is sufficient. Akbar is who? The one who resembles the Prophet most in what? In looks? In manners? In speech? And in akhlaq? In, in manners, in speech, in reason, and in looks. The Imam would come and say, whenever we must Rasulullah, we look at Ali Akbar. Okay? This is his eldest son here. The Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Prophet saying, and you conform yourself to a sublime morality. Who resembles this morality the most? Akbar. Ali Akbar. Who looks like him the most? Ali Akbar. Whose speech and mantik and reason is like him the most? Here the Imam, here the Imam goes, and he gives all he gives the Ali Akbar back to Allah. Not one hundred years of worship. He gives Ali Akbar back to Allah, and look at what he comes and says, Ya Allah. Look what he comes and he says, My Lord, if these sacrifices please you, then take until you are fully pleased. If these sacrifices please you, then take until you are fully pleased. Not what will I get for drinking water. Not what I, what I get for giving you Ali Akbar. Ali Akbar satisfies you. I give you Qasim. I give you Azkhar. I give you my throat. I give you my back, Abbas. That's what you're saying. You know, the tragedy of that day is a hand, like you've mentioned before, as generous as Abu Abdullah's hand. As generous, as generous as his hand was. Imagine anyone saying no to a hand as generous as his. We've discussed this before. This hand that's so generous, Imam al-Sadiq comes and says, they block the access to the water of the Euphrates, which was available for dogs. Yeah. Imagine that crying. The household of Rasulullah, Sukayna, Rukayya, Azhar, Qasim, Abbas, Hussein. They are not afforded to drink water from the Euphrates while dogs are drinking from it, Salik. Imam Salik says. Look at that crime. And shukr on the tongue of Hussein. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be of those who are loyal like Abbas. Towards him and towards Ahlul Bayt before anything, and to preserve us from the treacherous nature, and to protect us from having a treacherous nature and betraying, betraying him, 
and Ahlul Bayt and then ourselves and our family and our community and our companions. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be of Ibadu Salihim, of his righteous servants, the lovers of Muhammad wa al Muhammad, the Shias of Amir al Mu'min, and the Muntadri of Ram Sahibi wa Asli wa Zanabi. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah.